So our producer asked me to stop and think about the important years in the 1940s. Obviously, the years leading up to 1945 involved the Second World War, and each of those early years has a gravitas all their own. 1947 sees the Marshall Plan, partition, the invention of the transistor, 1948 has the Berlin Airlift, the return of the Olympic Games, and the creation of Israel. 1949 sees the formation of NATO, the establishment of the People's Republic of China, and even the signing of the Fourth Geneva Convention on the treatment of prisoners of war. But what about 1946? Like some poor, talentless middle child, 1946 is there, but overlooked. Loved, of course, but so often overshadowed by the years around it. So today, let's take a look at 1946 and single out and talk about a few of those things that made the year special. I'm your host, David, and this week, we review the year that was. This is The Cold War. So 1946, the first full year since the end of the Second World War, was marked by the beginnings of a new bipolar world order and the normalization of peace, regional brutalities notwithstanding. The tension between the capitalist world and the socialist world was already exacerbating the deepening Cold War. Cultural and sporting events, suspended or curtailed during the war years, were slowly being restored and new events were being established. Technological progress, for so long focused on military purposes, began to focus on civil developments again and look towards improving everyday life. So in no particular order, here are some of the highlights of 1946. Despite having lost the general election in 1945, Winston Churchill, everybody's favorite elderly baby, still enjoyed immense popularity, forever ensconced for his key role in the defeat of Hitler and the Nazis. With a reputation as an orator, Churchill gave two notable speeches in 1946. In September, he gave a speech at the University of Zurich, where he called for an end to animosity in Europe, for a rapprochement between France and Germany, and for the establishment of a Council of Europe with an aim to achieving the unity of Western European nations based around shared liberal democratic values. The second speech, actually given before the Zurich speech, is possibly one of the most well-known speeches of the Cold War era, a speech Churchill himself titled Sinews of Peace. While on a trip to the United States, Churchill spoke at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri. The speech began by calling for a lasting unity among the English-speaking world, but specifically between the United States and Great Britain. The speech then went on to state that, quote, From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lay all the capitals of Central and Eastern Europe, end quote. For many, this speech marked the start of the Cold War, but that debate aside, it cemented the phrase Iron Curtain in public discourse and established itself as the metaphor to demonstrate the separation of the capitalist and socialist worlds. While the speech was well accepted in the West, Stalin's response was to describe it as, quote, warmongering. Now, 1946 also saw the production of new commercial goods for purchase by the average Soviet citizen. Included in this, for the first time, was the passenger car. In the West, car ownership was becoming quite normalized, but Soviet production had so far lagged behind. Although Soviet industrial capacity continued to grow dramatically, it was largely dedicated towards the needs of the state, something that did not change with the end of the Great Patriotic War. But Soviet leadership also understood that public transportation was not going to be enough to meet the needs of the country. And of course, from a propaganda perspective, it was important that the Soviet Union not look too deficient in meeting transport needs. So the Moskvich 400 was introduced, based on the plans for the 1939 Opel Cadet, personally selected by Stalin. The first car came off the assembly line at the MZMA plant in Moscow in December of 1946. The 400 was powered by a 23 horsepower inline four engine with a three-speed manual transmission. The car cost 8,000 rubles to purchase at a time when the average worker made 520 rubles per month. This meant that the purchase of a new car was no small matter, but the Soviet Union was now in the automobile game. 
Moving on to the world of arts and culture, so severely curtailed during the war years, its revival began in earnest in 1946. The French Riviera played host to an international film festival in the city of Cannes. Originally scheduled to be held during September 1939, but cancelled due to the outbreak of war, 1946 saw the French decide to try to host again. Mind you, the intent was less about celebrating film and more about reviving the tourism industry along the Riviera. So on September 20th, the first Cannes Film Festival began. Films from 18 different nations took part. Unsurprisingly, most of the films shown were thematically centered around the war or at least touched on the subject. Included in the showings were Austrian-American director Billy Wilder's The Lost Weekend, Italian director Roberto Rossellini's Open City, French director René Clement's The Battle of the Rails, and British director David Lean's Brief Encounter. While we largely recognize Khan today as a competition in the film industry, the first year was largely about the spirit of international cooperation, and as such, nine films received a Grand Prix of the Khan Festival. We would be remiss to note here also that the festival was far from the cultural and economic powerhouse that it has become today, and the festival was actually cancelled in 1948 and 1950. So even while the Second World War was still being fought, the Allies had made the decision to establish a process to try and punish the war crimes and the crimes against humanity that had been perpetrated by the Nazis. In August of 1945, the legal mechanisms had been agreed to by the USSR, the United States, Great Britain, and France, and were laid out in the London Charter, also known as the Nuremberg Charter, or the Charter of the International Military Tribunal. The trials were to be held in the city of Nuremberg, chosen in part because of its deep historic ties to the Nazi movement, but also because it was relatively unscathed by the damages of war. The trials actually began in November of 1945, but the bulk of them were conducted through 1946. Chaired by British judge Sir Geoffrey Lawrence, such prominent Nazi leaders as Hermann Göring, Martin Bormann, Rudolf Hess, Albert Speer, Eric Rader, Hans Frank, William Frick, and Alfred Jodl were tried. While the Allied powers each had their prosecuting lawyers, each of the defendants had lawyers of their own, and they were given the opportunity to defend themselves against the charges laid. By October of 1946, the trials had ended, and of the 24 people tried, 12 were given death sentences, 7 received prison sentences, ranging from 10 years to life in prison, 3 were acquitted, and 2 had the charges against them dropped. 1946 also saw the lesser-known counterpart to the Nuremberg Trials, the International Tribunal for the Far East. Convening on the 29th of April, judges from the four great powers, as well as Australia, New Zealand, India, China, Canada, the Netherlands, and the Philippines, presided over the trials of 28 Japanese military and political leaders, including Koki Hirota, Hideki Tojo, Kichiro Hiranuma, and Shigenori Togo. Now, since these trials lasted until 1948, we aren't going to talk about the outcomes, but the aim of both of the tribunals was to send a message that in the post-war era, war crimes and crimes against humanity would no longer be tolerated. The refrain of never again rang through the halls of justice. Of course, history has shown us that talk is the easy part. Now, in 1946, the United States was the sole nuclear power. While it was the sole possessor of the atom bomb, the United States knew their technological advantage couldn't last forever and continued developing their nuclear arsenal knowing the military advantage it conferred. With early tests having been conducted in the deserts of New Mexico, it was decided that a new test range was needed, one more remote and farther away from the US people. And everybody, really. Bikini Atoll was deemed the perfect place. A coral atoll in the Marshall Islands, removed from both air and shipping routes, and secure from the prying eyes of the enemy. Of course, we should point out that despite being remote, Bikini was not uninhabited. The US government undertook a program of resettling the population of Bikini to nearby Rongerik Atoll. By 1946, the population of Bikini had been replaced by a veritable army of scientists, military personnel, and technical workers which had descended on the atoll. Two shots took place in June and July, Abel and Baker making up Operation Crossroads. 
And this began a long series of atomic tests at Bikini as the US developed more and more powerful atomic weapons. Of course, with the world's attention turned to Bikini Atoll, that attention manifested itself in a variety of different forms. Probably the most ubiquitous was swimwear. The summer of 1946, the first in years without the shadow of global war hanging over it, had a general mood of relief and of peace. For many, the mood was enhanced by feelings of liberation, and many expected these feelings to be extended into all facets of life. Of course, many of the hangovers of war remained, including a shortage of fabric. So the natural result was that the swimwear was ordered to use less cloth. The French, because of course it was the French, began producing a two-piece swimsuit. One of the early designs dated to May 1946 and was called the Atom and was advertised as the smallest swimsuit in the world. Although it was two pieces, the person's navel was still covered and the Atom didn't attract too much attention. But then in July, designer Louis Rayard displayed the much smaller and much more revealing Bikini Atoll, described as being like the atom bomb, Bikini is small and devastating. The Bikini was born. Although there was, and probably still is, some conservative backlash to the Bikini, that was not enough to stop production and consumption of the swimwear, and over the years it has become the most popular form of women's swimwear in the world. The Japanese government and the Japanese Imperial General Headquarters to sign the Now, remaining in the Pacific, January 1st, 1946 marked a symbolic turning point in Japan. For centuries, the Emperor maintained a divine role in Japan, accepted as a descendant of the Sun Goddess. Although Emperor Hirohito was not the ruler of the country through the Second World War, he enjoyed an immense amount of respect from the people and, vitally, gave credibility to the wartime government. In addition, Japanese theories of racial superiority were directly linked to the mythology and propaganda which surrounded the emperor and the imperial family. After the Japanese surrender, one of the aims of the US occupation was to prevent Japan from ever becoming an aggressive, expansionist power again. And also from being a potential rival in the Pacific Basin again, of course. The Americans aimed to help do this by denouncing the propaganda points which had fueled Japanese militarism in the first place, and this included the divine status of the emperor. Hirohito did not initially want to renounce this status, however he was coerced into doing so in exchange for an American pledge to not prosecute him or the imperial family at the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunals. On January 1st, Emperor Hirohito gave a New Year's speech to the Japanese public, during which he renounced himself being a living god, stating that the Japanese people did not need myths and legends to remain united. The end of the Great Patriotic War created a sense of hope among the citizens of the Soviet Union. It was a feeling that since they had won the war, that they had sacrificed so much and so many millions had died, that they had proven their worth and could now expect and deserve better from Comrade Stalin and the Soviet Union. Rumors even began to spread that the peasants would be allowed to leave their areas of residence and would no longer be forced to work on the kolkhoz. These hopes, however, were in vain. The man of the mustache had no plans on relaxing his iron grip over the country and its citizens. Repressions continued and living standards showed no signs of improving. True freedom of expression remained a dream as arts and culture remained in the service of the state, a tool to help raise strong Soviet citizens with strong socialist values. For example, the great Soviet film director Sergei Eisenstein labored through 1946 under the immense stress put on him by the state. Eisenstein was already considered politically suspicious as a result of time he had spent abroad in the 1920s and the 1930s, but starting in 1942, was ordered to make the ideological important trilogy on Ivan the Terrible. The first part, released in 1944, won a Stalin Prize, but part two, filmed in 1946, was deemed ahistorical by the Central Committee and was not released. Both Molotov and Stalin met with Eisenstein, where he was criticized for ignoring ideological nuance. The levels of stress this caused is believed to have resulted in Eisenstein suffering a heart attack 
leading to his eventual death in 1948. Ivan the Terrible Part II, by the way, would not be released until 1958 during the Khrushchev Thaw, while the planned third part of the trilogy was just never made. Of course, Eisenstein wasn't the only one to face the wrath of the mustache in 1946. Andrei Zhdanov, a high-ranking party leader, became involved in the curation of Soviet arts and culture, and to say he was a strict ideologue would be an understatement. In August, at Zhdanov's direction, the party openly criticized the literary magazines The Leningrad and Zezda for publishing works by the poet Anna Akhmatova, as well as the satirist Mikhail Zhoshchenko. Akhmatova was criticized for decadence, pessimism, and a lack of ideological base in her works, while Zoschenko was attacked for creating a caricature of Soviet citizens, laws, and lifestyle, and for not having contributed to the war effort. Both of these figures were dismissed from the Soviet Union of Writers, making work and life in the Soviet Union very difficult. 1946 saw continued discussion and debate surrounding the so-called Jewish question, with the main debate focused on the desire for a Jewish state, and if one could be created, where it should be. This was seen as a fix to the seemingly perennial persecution of Jews in Europe. Even with the condemnation of the Holocaust, atrocities against Jews in Europe continued. July 4, 1946 saw a pogrom in the Polish city of Kielce where 42 Jews were killed. In the British Mandate of Palestine, the push to create an independent Jewish state increased while the British resisted, wanting to maintain the status quo that had existed between the Jewish and Arab populations. To this end, the British moved to curtail the operations of some of the most radical organizations in the Mandate. June saw the execution of Operation Agatha, resulting in the arrest of 2,700 activists from the Jewish Agency, Haganah, Irgun, and other groups. Captured along with these activists were documents proving the organized preparations for an insurgent movement against British rule. Following Operation Agatha, Irgun immediately began planning a response. The target was the King David Hotel, the headquarters of the British administration in Palestine. On July 22nd, an explosion ripped through the building, killing 91 people. The attack was condemned by the Jewish agency, but marked a turning point towards escalating violence in Palestine. This was an increase that eventually caused the British to turn to the United Nations to decide the fate of Palestine. Turning to South America, 1946 saw the rise of power of Juan Perón. Perón had been a colonel in the Argentine army at the time of the 1943 coup. Following the coup, he was made an assistant to the Secretary of War and later the Labor Secretary. His real rise to prominence, however, came as a result of his successful relief operation for victims of the San Juan earthquake, during which he met and began a relationship with a minor movie star, Eva Duarte. His rising popularity, however, was seen as a threat to the junta, and he was dismissed from government in September 1945, and then arrested. Mass public demonstrations against this followed, organized and fueled by Eva. After his release in October of 1945, Juan and Eva were married. Juan then became the Labour Party presidential candidate for elections in February 1946, where Perón swept into power on promises of social justice, welfare, and improvements to infrastructure. While Perón was able to follow through on his promises, he was heavily criticized for the repressive methods that were used to do so. His popularity in the face of these criticisms was helped by, well, yeah, you guessed it, his wife, who was very active in her work with the poor as well as the establishment of women's suffrage in Argentina in August of 1946. From a strictly Cold War perspective, Perón is notable for being one of the first world leaders who refused to take sides in the deepening conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. He became an early proponent of the so-called Third Way between socialism and capitalism. Now, as I mentioned earlier, during the war years, production and development of consumer goods had been largely curtailed, but the end of the war saw a massive shift back towards civilian production. Next, something from the fruit group. Look at all the different kinds. 
cherries, pears, apples, pineapples. 1946 was the year this all began to blossom as new consumer goods began to really hit markets. Some of these items had been developed for the war effort, but were being repurposed, sunscreen being one of them. By the way, if I could offer you one tip for the future, sunscreen would be it. But anyway, 1946 saw Austrian chemist Franz Greiter produce a highly effective sunscreen marketed by the name of Glacier Cream or Glacier Cream in English. Tide washing detergent became the first detergent specifically designed for automatic washing machines and was introduced to market by late 1946, designed to make the tiresome household chore of washing clothing easier. No more going down to the river, I guess. But new products weren't just for the home or for the individual, they were for business too. 1946 saw the inventor Chester Carlson sign a contract with the Haloid Corporation of New York for an automated copying device he had invented several years earlier. The process was renamed Xerography, and the Haloid Corporation would become so successful that they would go on to rename their company after the process which Carlson sold to them. Xerox, and an easy way to make a hundred copies of a picture of your own butt was born. Shifting our attention now to India, the drive for independence regained its momentum, having been on hold somewhat during the war years. Britain, reluctant to lose its crown jewel of its empire, was however facing pressure not only by Indians, but also from the United States, with their talk of self-determination and democracy, to grant India independence. India, however, was hardly a uniform state, and internal divisions complicated the course of the independence process. The Hindu population in India was largely led by the Indian National Congress and pursued the idea of a united India. Muslim Indians, on the other hand, were represented by the Muslim League and wanted a separate state for Muslims. One of the key sticking points to this, however, was that the majority of Muslim regions in Imperial India were not contiguous, but instead occupied separate regions. The disagreement forced the leaders of the Muslim League to call for a direct action day in the East Bengal city of Calcutta, that's modern day Kolkata, which had a large population of both Muslims and Hindus. The British were convinced to make it a non-working day and newspapers and mosques called on the Muslim population to demonstrate on the 16th of August. Hundreds of thousands of people took to the streets in what was supposed to be a peaceful demonstration, but intercommunal violence quickly flared, and it's estimated that between 4,000 and 10,000 people were killed, with as many as 100,000 more people displaced. In fact, British troops needed to be deployed to end the violence. This would not be the last instance of intercommunal violence in India, and clearly demonstrated that the independent struggle in the country was shifting its focus from being Indians versus the British to being Hindu versus Muslim. 1946 saw a landmark ruling by the Supreme Court of the United States, one which would have a massive effect. In 1944, Irene Morgan, an employee of the Glenn L. Martin Aircraft Company in Baltimore, was arrested for her refusal to move to the segregated colored section of a Greyhound bus she was traveling on between her mother's house in Virginia and her home in Baltimore, Maryland. The case went through the courts, making its way before the Supreme Court, where the court ruled that the Jim Crow laws enforcing segregated interstate travel were unconstitutional. Although this ruling would be ignored by many states, especially in the South, Morgan v. Virginia has been widely recognized as one of the key milestones of the modern civil rights movement and the struggle against racism and segregation in the United States. Remaining in the United States, although the nation had emerged from the war as the most powerful state on earth, it does not mean that there were no domestic problems to deal with. One of the biggest challenges was the restructuring of the economy from its total war footing to one of a peacetime economy. Included in this was ensuring that there were jobs for returning servicemen, and then settling the inevitable labor disputes which followed. Although labor unions had opted during the war to set aside their stridency in order to ensure that war production remained steady, with the fighting done, the unions once again took a more active stance in advocating for labor rights. They sought more worker-friendly workplaces, but most of all wanted higher wages for workers to help offset the high inflation rate of the time. 
As the war ended, worker strikes began. Initially in 1945, it was in the oil sector, but by early 1946, electrical workers, meat packers, the lumber industry, teamsters, and steel workers were all conducting labor actions. Cities like Rochester and Pittsburgh saw general strikes take hold, grinding those cities to a halt. When both the United Mine Workers and the National Railroad Workers laid down tools and took to the picket lines, President Truman decided to act. He ordered the federal government to seize the affected coal mines and then took over the railroads. Now, despite the government having broken the strikes, the net effect in the labor market was that, overall, wages did increase across a multitude of different industries. The strikes also, however, had the effect of causing a number of laws to be passed, making it more difficult for workers to unionize. In Southeast Asia, 1946 saw France trying to restore its overseas empire, specifically in Indochina. In 1969, a courier was dispatched to Hanoi to deliver a secret letter to the ailing Ho Chi Minh, national hero and leader of the North Vietnamese people. The Viet Minh, led by Ho Chi Minh, but in conjunction with other Vietnamese nationalist groups, called for the independence of Vietnam. Now, at the time, troops of the Chinese nationalist Kuomintang occupied northern Vietnam. Chiang Kai-shek was using his troops as leverage against the French, with Chiang threatening to go to war with France if the French would not give up their own concessions on Chinese territory. In exchange, the KMT offered to withdraw the troops from northern Vietnam, allowing the French back in. It was a deal the French agreed to. As French troops began to deploy back into Vietnam in 1946, tensions began to rise, including the conduct of some small-scale military operations. As the year progressed, these clashes increased until the outbreak of what was effectively full-scale war by the 19th of December and the outbreak of what has become known as the Battle of Hanoi. Clearly, the establishment of peace in the post-war world was going to be a complicated affair as the desire for self-determination ran up against old empires struggling to maintain their power. And now, finally, let's have a look at the world of sports. With the professional leagues around the world being largely shut down or sidelined during the war, 1946 was the year that sport began to reclaim its place in people's lives. Some of the highlights from the year, and this is by no means a comprehensive list, include the resumption of professional football leagues, including those in Italy, France, and England. Although 1946 was supposed to have been a World Cup year, there had just not been enough time to organize the tournament, and like in 1942, it was cancelled. 1946, however, did see the third European Athletic Championship being held, notable for being the first to combine both men's and women's disciplines. Test cricket, a total mystery to this Canadian, restarted in 1946 as Australia beat New Zealand in the first international test match since the end of the war. I don't know how many days the match lasted, but I'm sure that there were breaks taken to drink tea. Competitive tennis resumed, as Wimbledon and the Australian Opens were held, as well as the Davis Cup. In the world of competitive pugilism, the sweet science, boxing, the great Joe Lewis returned from his military service and defended his title as heavyweight champion of the world in a rematch against Billy Kahn. And that is a recap of 1946. Some of these things we've touched on in episodes, while much of this is relatively new in our presentation. We hope that this format has provided a bit of context, a bit of a wider view to what else was going on in the first full year of peace. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode, and to make sure you don't miss all of our future episodes, please make sure you subscribe to our channel and have impressed the bell button. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com, and we're active on Facebook and Instagram at The Cold War TV. If you enjoy our work, your financial support would be greatly appreciated at Patreon via www.patreon.com slash The Cold War or through YouTube membership. This is The Cold War Channel, and don't forget, the trouble with The Cold War is that it doesn't take too long before it becomes heated. <laughs>